Thank you, Hannah. I'm most grateful to you and your colleagues for this opportunity to speak to you today, and I'll welcome your comments. Do note my email address. I'm now going to share the screen and bring up my PowerPoint. Uh, and start here. Okay. Uh, all right. So you can see my email. Gilles Carlier, the Dean of Cambrai Cathedral during its period of musical glory, is hardly known to musicologists. He was the author of only one text about music, his treatise on the twofold practice of church music and divine services of circa 1470, which is a defense of church music, especially polyphony, and was cited by Tinctoris. Carlier also wrote liturgical texts that were set to chant by Guillaume du Fay for the feast of the Recollectio Festorum Beate Marie Virginis, as I determined, which was first celebrated at Cambrai Cathedral in 1458. Carlier is not known to have composed music, however. Gilles Carlier is remembered in first place as a prominent theologian who played a defining role in the most significant political event of his day, if not of the 15th century, the Council of Basel. In the first part of my paper, I'm going to demonstrate that Carlier's travels to Prague and Bohemia between 1433 and 1436, as a deputy sent by the council to negotiate with the Hussites, had wide ranging consequences at Cambrai Cathedral. In 1449-50, when the Feast of St. Anne began to be celebrated with an octave, it gained a central European office and a melismatic antiphon, perhaps from Prague. In 1454, a canon and friend of Carlier introduced the Feast of the Visitation with an office composed by the Bishop of Prague, Jan of Jenstein. In 1458, an entirely new Marian feast was first celebrated, which recollected six feasts of the Virgin Mary on the fourth Sunday in August. Carlier had been commissioned to compose its office texts, and some resulted from what he saw and heard in Prague and Bohemia. In 1462, Carlier was asked to revise the statutes of the Premonstratensian order, which had an early and influential community at the Strahov Monastery in Prague. This order would celebrate the Recollectio longer than any other until 1953. That could have been a consequence of Carlier's travels. Finally, in 1472, the Gothic building of Cambrai Cathedral was completed and consecrated with the time-honored dedication ritual, exceptionally making use of the Hebrew alphabet for the alphabet ceremony. Did Carlier bring back a Tehillim or Jewish Psalter from the Jewish quarter in Prague? In the second part of my paper, I argue that the council's choice of Carlier to negotiate with the Hussites was a consequence of historical precedents. The transmission of music from Paris to Prague through the intermediary of a 13th century Bishop of Cambrai, Guillard of Laon, who had been involved in the establishment of the Feast of Corpus Christi, and especially in 1416, the condemnation and execution of Jan Hus at the Council of Constance by a tribunal led by Cardinal Pierre Dailly, Bishop of Cambrai, from 1397 to 1411. I contend that because Carlier carried the weight of this history of Hus's condemnation, he was moved to make the exceptional effort that resulted in the compacts, the agreement between the Council and the Hussites, and also to introduce it as cathedral selected chants from Bohemia that expressed a spirituality that he had seen, heard, and felt. After the Council of Basel ended in 1449, Carlier having left in 1436, the canons of Cambrai Cathedral improved their sanctorale with foundations for two reasons to prepare for the installation in 1452 in their Trinity Chapel of a new Byzantine-style painting seen on the right, that of Notre Dame de Grasse, an image said to have been painted by St. Luke, and for the formal consecration of their Gothic cathedral in 1472, whose 13th century choir in Villard's sketchbook is on the left. The already introduced Feast of St. Anne, Mother of the Virgin Mary, was given an octave in 1449-50, but surviving chant from Cambrai was only copied after 1458 and printed in the Antiphoner 1508-15. 
This office is only found in late sources among Contus manuscripts and not in the Tsao Etza volume of Prague. The rhymed mode six Magnificat Antiphon, O Rosa Vernalis, introduced in Cambrai, was certainly known in Prague, however, because of its text in Chippet is that of the short prosa that survives only in the Missal Prague of 1522, and Hanno Werner has found a related sanctus trope, O Vernalis Rosula, in Prague manuscripts. Here, underlining is a triadic rise, bold high pitches, and blue a scalar descent. O Rosa Vernalis appears in two processionals from Cambrai, the earliest regional manuscripts to include it. In Cambrai 70, it's in a gathering with chant for the visitation and transfiguration, both feasts especially cultivated in Prague, and two of the transfiguration chants, though not the entire office, were sung in Prague. O Rosa Vernalis is also in six antiphoners from Marchienne near Douai, which had a relic of Anne's foot and in an antiphoner from Saint-Quentin, Ile of 1616. This slide shows the Cambrai melody of O Rosa Vernalis. Notice the third noon beginning, a climacus, because it distinguishes the Cambrai version. It's absent in the later sources, like this one from Münster. In 1454, a canon whose testamentary executor Carlier would be introduced the Feast of the Visitation at Cambrai Cathedral. This alone was not surprising because the cathedral had always been dedicated to the Virgin Mary and St. John the Baptist, but that the feast should have been introduced after the Council of Basel by the same founder who had introduced the Recollectio suggests that the two foundations were planned together with Carlier's participation. Here to the right, a typical painting of the visitation. This is from Arras, 37 kilometers west of Cambrai. That the Cambrai visitation would be celebrated with an office mainly comprised of chant by Jan of Jenstein, an Archbishop of Prague educated in music, who originally championed the feast, rather than the papally approved office by Adam Easton, also points to Carlier. Jenstein's office, Exurgens Alte Maria, begins with antiphons taken from the visitation gospel that you just saw. And here you can see that most of Jenstein's office was sung in Cambrai. The variants, many are for versicles, are not significant. Of the more than 100 antiphoners indexed by Cantus, no note notated sources from the Cambrai re region earlier than the Cambrai antiphoner of 1508 contain the 14th century Jenstein office, but it's also in the not indexed late 15th century Williamite antiphoner from Cambrai. In 1582, what was added to the end of a monastic antiphoner, Arras 465 from St. Vedas, where it had a different opening antiphon and some variants. Carlier did represent the Bishop of Arras when the Council of Basel opened, and the Arras visitation altarpiece you just saw dates from the 1430s when Carlier was in Basel. Yet there's no evidence that the visitation office was celebrated in Arras before it reached the cathedral. Carlier probably introduced the Jenstein visitation when his friend founded this feast in 1454. It was copied together with the Recollectio to be discussed in many breviaries and missiles not long afterwards. In 1457, an entirely new Marian feast was introduced to recollect the sixth feast of the Virgin Mary on the fourth Sunday in August, and Carlier was commissioned to compose its office text. They too reflect his time in Prague and Bohemia in many ways. Notable but less important is that Carlier adopted for the Recollectio two Song of Songs text in chippets from Jenstein's visitation office. Within the Recollectio office, Carlier placed recollections of the visitation at several midpoints deliberately in order to emphasize Mary and John the Baptist, the cathedral's two patron saints, and the central persons in Luke chapter 1, the apostle was said to have painted Notre Dame de Grasse of Cambrai. In Recollectio Matins, the fourth responsory in verse quote the visitation gospel. Then, 
Carlier tells that gospel story in his own words in the fifth of the nine matins lessons, which is then sung in the fifth responsorine verse. The sequence contrafactum with Carlier's text composed specifically for the Recollectio was nevertheless sung during the visitation at two important cathedrals which did not celebrate the Recollectio, Notre Dame in Amiens and Saint John the Evangelist in Besançon. Carlier's sequence, like the two Recollectio hymns, recalls Mary's feast, but Carlier's contrafact of the 12th century Annunciation sequence, Mitidat Virginem, is not at all what it seems to be from its incipit Mitidat Sterilem. Normally on the Feast of the Visitation, the Sterilem is Elizabeth, the aged mother of John the Baptist, but in this text it's Anne, the mother of the Virgin Mary. In stanza two, the subject changes to Mary herself, whose chastity is confirmed by our promise, the well-known words, et ancilla domini, implicit here, which are followed by the Annunciation story. Only in stanza 3b is the visitation recalled. It's only mentioned in the sequence and at a midpoint. The sequence then continues with Christ's birth, his presentation in the temple, and Mary's assumption, with the choir of angels set to low pitches, however. In stanzas one and five, God send angels to the mothers, but all other stanzas are narrations that recount Mary's virtues or actions in third person singular. Although Dufay set Carlier's Recollectio text, he did not compose chant for this sequence. I think a deliberate decision to allow the familiar Annunciation melody to be heard, thus underscoring the two conceptions, the visitation, Mary's exceptional life, and the exceptional grace bestowed on her and on John the Baptist with Christ, who saved them both. In this way, Carlier's sequence prepares the gospel reading, precisely that borrowed from the Feast of the Visitation. Among the texts Carlier wrote for the Recollectio, some refer to or imply the state of pregnancy of the mothers or describe their wombs or unborn infants. Stanza three of the hymn for First Vespers calls Mary Puella Gravida. She's called Puella due to her virginal state. In Antiphon one of Matins, Mary is conceived by the sterile Anna and will produce the flower that's Christ. Since Mary is only born in Antiphon two, she's still in Anna's womb in Antiphon one. In Antiphon 3, the Holy Spirit covers the virginal womb. Antiphon 4 is the visitation, Carlier's text describing the pregnant virgin whose star, since the virgin is the morning star, star of the sea, shines upon the unborn Baptist. Antiphon 5 calls Elizabeth the old, old woman but new mother. So Elizabeth is pregnant, but wombs are not mentioned. Lessons four and five both refer to the uterus of Mary. In response three four, Elizabeth says she will go to the mountains and see the verbum, that's Christ. But only in response three verse five does the baby John the Baptist leap for joy, with no mention of Elizabeth's womb or of Christ. Lesson eight is an elaborate praise of the virginal womb as the palace of Christ, but this text nowhere refers to the visitation. At Lodz, Anna gives birth. The virgin's womb conceives Christ. In the fourth antiphon, Aunt Mary is about to consecrate the birth of John the Baptist in Elizabeth's uterus, named because it's in the Bible. Thus far, no recollectio texts contradict biblical accounts. When Carlier's descriptions of the three mothers are compared, we observe that Anna gives or has given birth, but is not described as pregnant, nor is her womb mentioned, surely because the conception of Mary was controversial at that time. The uterus of Elizabeth is in the Bible, so Carlier could include it. By contrast, he describes the womb of the Virgin Mary often and with varied language. She is heavily pre pregnant, gravida, fecund, fecundata, a tabernacle, her uterus is mentioned many times, and her venter, or belly or stomach, is described as a large palace in Lesson 8. Carlier in this way gives priority to the Virgin Mary as Mother of Christ. 
Carlier's hymn for Lauds is entirely new, however. The fourth stanza of eight tells us that the Holy Spirit is rejoicing. Mary goes to the heights that are the mountains. The soldier John the Baptist adores the Lord enclosed, dominum inclusum, so in the womb, though this is not said. And the light illuminates the same patriarch, Zacharias, John's father, in whose house the visitation takes place. Carlier also refers to Zacharias in Matins Antiphon 5. Even if no uteruses or wombs are mentioned, it's clear that the unborn John is looking at the unborn Jesus, which occurs nowhere in the Bible. This unusual text that is not in Janstein's office or in the Bible corresponds to paintings Gilles Carlier could have seen only in Bohemia or Hungary. The wood carving, illumination, and paintings of the visitation that I'm about to show from these regions and isolated locations in southern Germany draw the viewer's eyes to the open cross sections of the wombs of Elizabeth and Mary within which the children appear facing each other. They surely would have surprised an onlooker familiar with French or Netherlandish altarpieces like Gilles Carlier. This type of image has been traced back to a Virgin Mary with child upright in her breast in a miniature of a Syriac manuscript of the 7th or 8th century, and then to an image perhaps from before 1300 that depicts the unborn children in the laps of Mary and Elizabeth. It's in Codex 297 of the National Library in Belgrade, and is evidence that this type of image in Central Europe predates Jenstein's promotion of the visitation. Seen here and from circa 1310 to 20 is a painted and gilded walnut carving of the visitation from southern Germany by Master Heinrich of Constance, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. From soon afterwards is this illumination to the left in the gradual from Vonenthal, a female Cistercian abbey near the town of Kensingen in Baden-Württemberg which includes a substantial sequence repertory and has chant with concordances in Czech manuscripts, according to Hanna Ulohova Werner. Visitation paintings with the two mothers and visible infants also include a South German altarpiece for the women's convent of Niedernburg in Passau of circa 1410 to 20, a painting from soon after 1430 from the Czech town of Budweiss, showing John praying and Jesus blessing him, and two other early 15th century images of cross sections of the mother's wombs showing the infants are in the St. Agnes Museum, one from Chesky Krumlov. A striking Hungarian painting of this type of circa 1450, so after Carlier's travels in the east, is this painting seen to the right from the Christian Museum in Estergom. Here the infant John the Baptist kneels across from the infant Jesus, surrounded by light. What these paintings collectively demonstrate is that they were numerous enough that Carlier may well have seen one. Especially interesting is this South Bohemian visitation of circa 1430, now in the St. Agnes Museum, the Ringhofer Heimsuchung from Vichybrod on the Moldau by the master of Rygern of circa 1420 to 30. Notice the two banderoles, that above Mary with the Magnificat excerpt from Luke, and that to the right above Elizabeth from the Visitation Gospel. The formal, former text was revised by Carlier to serve as the offertory of the Recollectio Mass, and the latter was sung in the Recollectio as the verse to response read five of Matins. In this painting, the two babies face each other, but John the Baptist is kneeling with hands clasped in prayer, thus adoring Christ, as in Carlier's hymn, and not leaping for joy as in the Bible while Jesus is standing with both arms bent and hands raised at his side. Visitation paintings like this one would have impressed Carlier, the learned theologian, especially because in 1414 he completed his master's thesis in theology at the University of Paris, an obligatory commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard. Carlier's topic was Book Three, Distinction Four, and the conception of the Virgin Mary that was so contested in his time. 
Carlier's text begins with preliminaries about human conception. He wrote that following Aristotle, early doctors of the church distinguished three conceptions, conceptio seminis, the initial conception or mixture of seed, conceptio carnis, the configuration of the body in the womb, and conceptio perfecta or conceptio hominis, the infusion of the soul in the body. To Carlier and the theologians he cited, Mary began to exist only at the infusion of her soul and not before. Although many writers of antiquity considered original sin a morbid material quality resulting from the libido producing the first conception, which would stain the soul at the moment of its infusion, Carlier wholly rejected this, writing that there was nothing impure in the human fetus, but only that the soul was devoid of grace and blessedness at first before God's grace brought it. The paintings Carlier could have seen in Bohemia showing fully formed children in the maternal uterus corresponded to what he had written as a young man. The babies are depicted at the moment after John the Baptist was in the state to have already received grace for which he worshiped Christ as thanks. Carlier was not the only poem to poet to evoke the theme of the unborn infants in liturgical chant. Dominican nuns developed the theme of the visitation in a dramatic way. In her address to the Medieval Academy in 2018, Margot Fausser described a remarkable sequence from the Dominican Reuerinnen Kloster Maria Magdalena in Freiburg am Breisgau, so very near Bonnenthal. In this sequence, Surgit Virgo, John the Baptist in the womb, describes what it's like to hear the Virgin's words and sense Christ. An unicum text so far, far as we know, it is a contrafactum as Foster recognized. The sequence melody and its structure taken from an earlier trope to Victime Pascali Laudes, the sequence Surgit Christus cum Trofeo. That sequence had other contrafacts in Hungarian and Zagrebi codices studied by Andrea Kovac, who dates the original Easter sequence to before 1305. Her two variant sequences are Susum Sonet Laudis Melos for the Octave of the Ascension and Sergit Virgo Cum Trofeo for St. Catherine. She noticed, as did Fassler, that similar reworkings of Circuit Christus for saints were found outside Hungary for the Marian Masses for the Christmas season, St. Francis and St. Cecilia. None of the extant Central European sequences of this type seem to have had the visitation as their subject. So until further notice, Fassler's visitation contrafactum is unique and from Breisgau, even if the melody is Hungarian. This slide shows the beginning of the text of the German Surgit Virgo, then the structure of the original Surgit Christus and of the Hungarian contrafact. And this slide demonstrates that the melodies of the German Surgit Virgo to the left and the Hungarian Surgit Christus to the right are the same. The question is, was the sequence like the German Surgit Virgo describing the visitation sung in Bohemia. While in Bohemia, Carlia probably also heard music. His final antiphon for the Recollectio office, Ave Virgo Speziosa Concepta Sine Macula, is a unique text consisting of eight lines of eight syllables. Its first line, Ave Virgo Speziosa, is rare in poetry and polyphony, although text in gibbets that rhyme with it are quite plentiful. Three polyphonic settings with the text in gibbets survive. The first by Bulkin was printed in, by Petrucci in Venice in 1505, so postdates Carlier, and it's a secunda pars belonging with a prima cars, pars for St. Catherine. But the second setting is a much older three-voice contrafactum in Radetz Karlove 47. Its text, Ave Virgo Speziosa Clarior Sideribus, is below a discontus, and the contratenor Inchipit Fobin Schwanz is of the song by Barbingagant. 
A similar four voice setting with the same text is in the Strahov choir book from circa 1460 to 80, but its repertory may include older liturgical compositions. So these two pieces were circulating in Bohemia. The text in Chippet Ave Virgo Speziosa begins several rhymed offices, but with different continuations, of which two are for Catherine and some are not Central European, but some are. Might Carly have remembered this text in Chippet Ave Virgo Speziosa Clari or Sideribus from Polyphony or Chant he heard in Prague and then composed his own antiphon text? The stars of the continuation could evoke the assumption, which is the subject of Carlier's recollectio and fun. It is interesting that Ave Virgo to the left, a chant I attribute to Dufay, has descending cadences of the words angelorum, exaltata, and secula that are like those used more frequently in the antiphon for St. Anne, or Rosa Vernalis, seen to the right because Dufay usually in the recollectio uses subtonal cadences. The Cambrasian melody is not found in Central European sources or indeed any others to my knowledge, however. Gilles Carlier would work closely with the Premonstratensian order, which had established the Strahov Monastery in Prague in 1142. According to Hanno Hova Werner, this order would play a key role in Bohemia and may have been responsible for its contacts with the West. Did Carlier visit these Premonstratensians in Prague, thus gaining a broader understanding of the order? Was such knowledge why he was in 1462 assigned to form the statues of the statutes of the entire Premonstratensian order, though this project only succeeded after the turn of the century. The Feast of the Recollectio was celebrated until at least 1953 in the Premonstratensian Abbey of Park, one of the oldest in Belgium, and it's precisely this house where a copy of Carlier's music treatise was kept. Finally, long after Carlier returned to Cambrai, indeed in 1472, the year he died, the Gothic building of Cambrai Cathedral was formally consecrated with a complete dedication ritual. A distinctive part of this ritual was the writing of, in Greek and Latin, of writing of Greek and Latin alphabets in ash on the pavement of the church to form a cross. But a cathedral account book of 1471 to 2 records that a scribe was paid to write down the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The other payments in the entry make it clear that the Hebrew alphabet was needed for the dedication ceremony. None of the four surviving pontificals from Cambrai includes a Hebrew alphabet, which is why the scribe would have had to supply one. How, are the th how the three alphabets would have been placed within the cross made on the pavement is unclear. Nevertheless, several early texts explain the alphabet ceremony. The anonymous Irish Ratio de Cursus of the mid 8th century and an Ambrosian dedicate Ordo from Luca assigned Psalm 118 in the Vulgate to the alphabet ceremony of the dedication. This psalm in Latin begins every eight verses with the Hebrew letters spelled out, continuing through the alphabet. In Hebrew, however, the psalm there numbered 119 is an acrostic, as can be seen here on the right. Might the choice of the psalm imply the use of a Hebrew alphabet for dedicating Christian churches very early on? There's no precedent for a similar use in Jewish dedications. Cecile Trefort pointed out that circa 1112, Bruno de Seigny was the first to identify the two alphabets with the two testaments and to compare them to the synagogue and church without evoking a Hebrew alphabet. Margot Fosser noted that to Hugh of St. Victor, the two different alphabets representing, represented the, that the Jews came first and then the Gentiles and both were united by Christ. The cross also joined the peoples of the Old and New Testament. 
Guillaume Durand in his Rationale, as translated by Thibodeau, elaborates the earlier ideas, quote, the alphabet written on the cross represents three things, that writing the Greek and Latin letters in the shape of a cross represents the fellowship or union in faith of the Jews and the Gentiles achieved through the cross of Christ. Coming from the east, Christ left the Jews on his left side since they were faithless, and he came to the Gentiles to whom he gave the right in order to be on his right hand side. And at last, having placed the Gentiles in the right on the east, he visited the Jews in the left corner in the West who remain inferior to the Gentiles to whom he first came. Thus, these letters are not written directly, but at an angle and in the form of a cross since those who do not accept the mystery of the cross and who do not believe that they are saved by the passion of Christ cannot fully reach the sacred knowledge. Second, he wrote that the alphabet represents the pages of both testaments which were fulfilled in the cross of Christ. And third, the ceremony represents the articles of faith since the pavement of the church is the foundation of our faith." Unquote. Most pertinent of all for Cambrai Cathedral is the commentary of a Benedictine monk, Nicolas Hugues Menard, writing in 1642 that an anonymous sermon on the dedication of a church in a manuscript from Corby, which also contained an early 12th century sermon by Ivo of Chartres on the dedication, explained that since the doctrine of the church used in sermons was in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, some bishops added the Hebrew alphabet to the ceremony. Frederick Warren explained that John 19, 19 to 20, records that the initials Inri were written on the cross in three languages, Hebrew, in reality Aramaic, Latin, and Greek, so that all could read them during Christ's crucifixion. Of interest is that the Abbey of Corby was not far from Amiens and Reims, was the seat of the archdiocese within which Cranberry was located. This northern French practice then of using Hebrew in fact conforms to Durandus' statements and the canons of Cambrai kept the Rationale in their choir. Durandus, the, the reason for Durandus, Durandus describes a biblical origin for the dedication ceremony that goes back first to God's commanding Moses to make a chrism to anoint the tabernacle and art of the Ark of the Covenant, and second to Solomon, Solomon the son of David's consecration of the temple with an altar and all of it, everything in it to be used for worship that the city of Cambrai had been compared to Jerusalem by its Benedictine community at their Abbey of the Holy Sepulchre also explains why the cathedral would respect any biblical model for its dedication. Even its new Marian painting was said to have been painted by the Apostle Luke. At Cambrai Cathedral, a model for the Hebrew alphabet could have been found any number of places since Cambrai did have a small Jewish quarter. Nevertheless, there had been no dedication ceremony in Cambrai since the 11th century. The surviving pontificals all date from before 1300, and there was no dedication in that century either. The Jewish community in Prague, the oldest and probably largest known in Europe, dates back at least to the 10th century, and it would surely have impressed Carlier. Here you see the cemetery that was there in the 15th century. Did Carlier return to Cambrai with a Hebrew prayer book? There is such a prayer book of Cambrai, Cambrai 946, the only one of its kind and it dates from the 14th or 15th century, but it's not digitized, and the microfilm at Irashte in Paris was lost when I checked it. It would require paleographical analysis. I contend that Carlier's negotiations with the Hussites were the consequence of a history of contacts between Cambrai Cathedral and Prague that date back to the 13th century. It's well known from the work of Hanno Hova and others that in the 13th century, Prague looked to Paris for the model of the Saint-Chapelle and its music. The manuscript Prague Castle Archives N8 is one of the most important sources of the poetry set to music by Philip the Chancellor of Notre Dame Cathedral, with 23 compositions by Philip which lack notation in that source, however. 
Its exemplar is thought to have been copied at the Sorbonne since the scribe of the manuscript also copied an inventory of the college's books. And it has many concordances with a manuscript that can be associated with Cambrai, the Edgerton manuscript known as Low B. To summarize a complex story, Gerard of Law, Bishop of Cambrai living in Paris, was also Chancellor at Notre Dame of Paris, the successor to Philip the Chancellor, and as such responsible for the books of the Magnus Liber Organi. Gerard later made Robert of Sorbonne, founder of the college, a canon of Cambrai. How this Prague manuscript got from Paris to Prague is not known, but its content was arguably due to the intervention of Guillard of Cambrai, who transmitted Philip's poetry after his death. It's also significant that Guillard preached on the Holy Sacrament and participated in the initial establishment of the Feast of Corpus Christi in Liège, given that communion was a concern for the Hussites. Fast forward to April 1414, when at the Council of Constance, Pierre Dailly, Bishop of Cambrai, and Cardinal since 1411, together with Jean Gerson and Francesco Zabarello, the patron of Chaconia, were charged with examining Jan Hus. Pierre Dailly presided over the tribunal, which condemned Hus in 1415, although the execution was carried out by civic authorities. Thus, it's only natural that for the Council of Basel to turn to a theologian from Cambrai, Gilles Carlier, to investigate the Hussite question. Carlier had all of IE's writings in his library at the Collège de Navarre in Paris, so he would have been well aware of that history. Jan Hus's execution inflamed his followers. In a riot in 1419, the Hussites captured the town hall of Prague and removed the ruling class. The Hussites had already separated into Utrechtists, moderates in Prague, and the rural and more radical Taborites. Not only did the religious questions become political issues in Bohemia and Moravia, but the ideas took hold in the West. Therefore, in 1420, Pope Martin V issued a bull urging a crusade against all heretics, especially the Hussites. In 1431, seeking a solution, the United Hussites presented four articles to Emperor Sigismund. These should permit the freedom of the Hussites to preach, communion of bread and wine, apostolic poverty of the clergy, and their way of punishing mortal sin. Sigismund rejected them, and internal Hussite wars continued until 1434. At the same time, the Council of Basel was convened to address what they saw as the threat to the Western Church. Three individuals well known to the composer Guillaume du Fay, who was at the court of Savoy during these years, played significant roles in initiating and leading the council. Cardinal Cesarini, the papal legate of Martin V, who had died in the meanwhile, who knew Gilles Carlier, convened the council. Cardinal Louis Allemand, president of the Council of Basel and in Ferrara, had been a patron of Dufay in Bologna. And Robert Oclou, Allemand's secretary in Bologna, was the deputy to the council from the court of Burgundy and a representative of the chapter of Cambrai Cathedral. That the Hussites were the first reason why the council was held suggests that Gilles Carlier and Oclou from Cambrai, with the others, must have played a crucial role in the decision to convene the council. At the first formal session of the council on 14 December 1431, its principal concerns were stated first among them the Hussite heresy. The next year, a Hussite delegation arrived in Basel, as did Gilles Carlier, who officially joined the council on April 25th. The council appointed him as one of four orators who would respond to the Hussites on the matter of how mortal sin should be punished. At his first public statement, a sermon he preached on the Feast of the Assumption, he argued for the primacy of the church and against the Hussites. On 4 January 1433, a delegation of 15 Hussite theologians with their entourage of 300 arrived in Basel. On January 10th, Cardinal Cesarini spoke, then the Hussite theologians, and then the four representatives of the council, including Carlier. 
I'm not going to recount all of the details of the council. Suffice it to say that the Hussite leaders made repeated travels to Basel, and in alternation, the conciliar deputies traveled multiple times to Prague and Bohemia. Here I note Carlier's travels. On 13 April 1433, Carlier and the hundreds of Hussites left for Prague, where Carlier spoke on June 5th, but then they returned to Basel, where celebrations took place on September 2nd because of an agreement reached on the use of the chalice. Then Carlier and the others returned to Prague, where he spoke at the Diet on November 18th. At this time, Carlier proved to be instrumental in drafting a response to the earlier four articles, the agreement, agreement known as the Compacts or Compactata. The first article of the Compacts allowed the Hussite Church to administer the blood as well as the body of Christ to the laity in Bohemia and Moravia. The other three articles allowed reasonable punishment for mortal sin, only police or worthy deacons to pray, preach the word of God, and prohibited priests from owning worldly possessions such as hereditary estates and charged them to administer the property of the church faithfully. A first draft of the compacts was signed in Prague on November 30, 1433, but negotiations continued. Carlier returned to Basel, and probably on March 4, 1434, he spoke on the topics of the Council, the Pope, and the Church. Then on January 7, 1435, Cardinal Alamán sent Carlier back to Bohemia, and he spoke in Prague after April 14, then returning to Basel. He returned to Bohemia in 1436 and was in Alba Regia in Hungary on February 25th. That year, the compacts were ratified again by the Bohemians and Moravians, but by this time, Carlier returned to Cambrai. The council ratified the compacts in January 1437, but delayed the formal pronouncement until December that year. It was determined that all com although communion of both kinds was permissible, it was not necessary. A manuscript dated 1437 with marginal notes by Carlier and his signature includes his speeches and John of Palomar's Opusculum Contra Husitas. Carlier gave this book to his College of Navarre in Paris. Further decrees pertaining to the Hussites were accepted by the council in March 1439 but the Hussite beliefs never disappeared and contributed to the strength of Protestantism. Pope Nicholas V in 1451 demanded that the Hussites abandon the compacts and submit to the Latin Church, and in 1462, Pope Pius II abrogated any obligation of the Church to abide by them. No popes would ever recognize the compacts. While Carlier was still in Prague, a Eutychist Synod took place on 25 July 1434 at the Church of St. James, and matters of music were discussed. The decision about Cantus Fractus is interesting because it's found in many Czech and Central European manuscripts, and a Credo, Sanctus, and Agnus with it are in the choir books Cambrai 6 and 11, dating from the time of the Council. Cantus Fractus is the subject of a conference to be held here in Prague in this November. It's interesting that just a year later, on 9 June 1435, the Council of Basel similarly issued decrees prescribing the proper conduct of, of the divine service. The Council of Basel produced considerable traffic in manuscripts, and a small festive votive missal thought to have been copied in the Archdiocese of Prague and certainly in Bohemia, dating from the 15th century, is now in Aosta. Aosta 55. In Aosta, where at the cathedral, the Recollectio was celebrated from circa 1460 to 1733. This manuscript is evidence that Czech manuscripts traveled west at this time. Its content strongly suggests an association with the council because it includes a mass for the conception of the Virgin on which a decree was passed in 1439. 
I've demonstrated that Carlier's travels to Prague and Bohemia as one of the delegates from the Council of Basel had consequences not only for the text that he wrote for the Recollectio, but also for other chant introduced at Cambrai Cathedral after the Council. This is a quite a rare example of such transmission, which is evident if the liturgy of Cambrai Cathedral is taken as a whole. I compared its sanctuary to that of Prague in the Tsao Etza volumes and note that the office for Anne, Barbara, Catherine, the Transfiguration, and the 11,000 Virgins aren't both liturgies but differ. Only the visitation and isolated chants for Anne and the Transfiguration are the same. The older 13th century Cambrai Antiphoner does include among additions the later office of St. Elizabeth of Hungary, which was widely disseminated and known in Prague, and the equally widely diffused office of the conception of the Virgin Gaudi Mater Ecclesia. But this last office has many variants when the Cambrai and Prague liturgies are compared. What I've not investigated is whether Carlier transferred polyphony from Cambrai to Prague. This certainly seems possible. That Carlier's travels to Bohemia during the Council of Basel included active theological reflection is evident from his use of the theme of the unborn boys greeting each other in the Recollectio and in his return to Cambrai with chants from Bohemia. What my study also demonstrates, I contend, is that Carlier, because he carried the weight of the history of the condemnation of Hus when he went to Bohemia, was moved to make the extra efforts that resulted in the agreement of the Prague Compacts. His definitive departure from the Council after the important discussion of the Compacts are an indication that this was his main concern. Character is almost impossible to judge from actions so distant in time. Yet Carlier's commentary on the sentence may be revealing. After his obligatory review of the views for and against Mary's immaculacy, he shifts abruptly to follow the reasoning of the acclamation of the people and argues in favor of the immaculate conception, therefore letting emotion replace reason. Similarly, in his recollection office, Carlier demonstrates his awareness of the views of his day, but closes with an antiphon affirming the Virgin Mary as sine macula. Thus, Carlier's past informed his actions in Prague and Bohemia, and his important activities of the post-conciliar years until his death may be associated with those travels and the impressions they left, the Cambrai liturgies of the Visitation and Recollectio especially, Carlier's work beginning in 1462 for Premonstratensius, and perhaps even the inclusion of Hebrew in the dedication liturgy the year he died. To close, let's listen to the hymn for Recollectio Lauds, recalling the six feasts of the Virgin Mary and including the visitation he saw so vividly depicted in Bohemia. This is Nunziat Angelus, performed by the Scola Hungarica under the direction of the late and admired Janka Sendre. I'm going to um, have to bring up the music. This will take one moment. Um, uh, Barbara, are you playing your example? Because we don't hear it. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Uh, just a moment. I have to take the, maybe. Sorry, one moment. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, we'll do it one more time. That's, that's uh, can... Okay, thank you. Okay. I, I, let me 
Well, you'll hear it. There are several verses, so you'll hear it. Okay. All right, thank you. So thank you. <laughs> Barbara. We are all muted, so I'm, I'm sure that the applause is much bigger, but uh, um, somewhere in the room. So thank you very much for the really fascinating paper that fits so well in the main topic of our project, which states that the send check um, uh, Czech lands were in center of music developments of that time in the 15th century. So you made it really so uh, clear people who come to Bohemia get inspired and uh, take the repertory with them or are inspired by the repertory, which is really absolutely fascinating. And I think that what is also clear uh, from your paper is how important in the liturgy all components are not only music but the text the visual side so how complex um, uh, issue it is and we cannot uh, understand one thing before one component without the other i remembered when you explained uh, the texts and uh, the visual depictions of visitation i could not but remember ritva jakobson who went with me sequence texts and said they had for sure depictions of this story in their church, otherwise you would not understand the text. So, exactly. But uh, it's so interesting how it's different in each region. Yeah. So thank you very much. And I think we have now um, uh, time for the discussion. Uh, we, uh, there are certainly questions and I would like to ask people who would like uh, to raise a question. There is a possibility, if you look at the uh, bottom participants, there is a um, there is a selection raise hand. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can write your question directly into the chat, which is also possible. Or so, maybe, um, I'm happy, I'm, I'm not good at this kind of technology, no, I mean, but I'm happy to answer anything and also if, somehow we don't get to you please send me an email i'm i'm happy to but maybe we have uh, questions already now so yeah, yeah. okay like to raise question maybe people need to be unmuted yeah rian it rian raise the hand so rian, you have to unmute and you can yeah am i unmuted yeah yes 
So maybe you. you can please uh, say you introduce yourself and uh, yeah, I say the question. Thank you. Hey, hi, I'm Rihanna. Um, studying in Prague, studying the visitation. So I found this very interesting. Um, my first question is: I was just wondering if you know the tune that the visitation was originally sung to in 1454 when it was introduced into Cambrai, because I know that the 1508 Cambrai manuscript has different tunes set to Jenstein's original text. Oh my goodness. Okay. I will, I will get back to you on that because uh, there is no earlier antiphoner, but there are processionals and other manuscripts. And I have some photographs, but others I would have to ask my colleague Christian Mayer, who has all of the notated sources. But I will get back to you. The other questions? You can raise your hand or just uh, type your question into the... I have a question for the Czech musicologists, including Hannah. Have you ever seen uh, the Surgit Virgo text or piece that concerns the visitation? Well, I am, uh, we are working on the catalog of sequences. Um, yeah and it is already online i it doesn't sound familiar to me but as uh, this is this is the funny thing that i can talk to you and type the address at the okay. same time and look at uh, if it is it's not very widely distributed for sure okay uh no no i don't have it yet um, and we have around 60s manuscripts so if it was it, if it was um, introduced in Bohemia, it was rather it, it did not belong to the primary sequences for the visitation. Okay. Was, uh, okay. Uh, really, it has another one question. <laughs> Sorry, it's I don't know if there's an answer to this question, but I was just wondering if there's any chance that Kalia could have made it to Prague before 1420 or knew someone who'd been in Prague before 1420 because I know that Jenstein had uh, an image similar to the ones that you were describing with the ex utero Jesus and John the Baptist with John sort of in a prayerful supplicatory position um, that it was um, on public display but it was destroyed in a fire in 1420. Oh my goodness. Um, I found the earliest record I found of Carlier being anywhere in Central Europe is a citation mentioned by Reinhard Strom that he was in Bratislava in 1429. So, so that's still, so I don't think he was there that early. Rianit, you are full of questions. So, <laughs> um, this is a very quick one. Um, you mentioned a canon who introduced the visitation in 1540. I was just wondering, is that Michael de Beringen or is it? Yes, just... exactly. Thank you. Yeah. And also, this talk is taken from uh, a chapter in my book. So, there is the full documentation will be there. I would have a question if nobody else has. So uh, if I may ask a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the influences uh, from Prague in Cambrai, is it something that is unique in context of Cambrai or do you, did, you, uh, did you notice influences from other places? The, the only really significant influence that comes from a, a, over a long distance is what I've written about with St. Elizabeth of Hungary, and that's because her heart actually was kept in the Cathedral of Cambrai, and she gave money for the choir that is sketched by Villard de Onecourt. Mm -hmm. so, so there have been continuous contacts with Hungary, um, and Esther Gom is twinned with Cambrai. I don't know if it is now, it certainly was 10 years ago. But I haven't found, uh, there, I'm trying to think, there is actually another kind of odd con connection with Cambrai 
and and the Netherlands. And I don't, this is in my book, I will just hint at it. It's kind of a can of worms. And that is that I think I have a liturgy when uh, Josquin's Ave Virgo, Mar Ave Maria Virgo Serena would have been sung and, or could have been sung at Cambrai. And there is, are some manuscripts in the Netherlands that have similar rubrics, but I haven't seen them. And Calvin Bauer doesn't have real complete information about them. So uh, I think there may be contacts with uh, the Netherlands as well. But uh, otherwise, no. And I think these Prague contact, uh, this, I think this is really very important. <laughs> I, I wondered um, because, um, as you, uh, I think, clearly demonstrated, the influence is so, so significant. Uh, we have at this time um, also significant um, exodus of uh, clerics in Bohemia during this unsettled time. Uh, do you think that it is possible that somebody accompanied Kabir to um, Cambrai, somebody who was really familiar with the uh, repertory in Bohemia? Or do you think that uh, Kabir could catch it really so quickly, so, uh, you know, to introduce it, to transfer it somewhere else? I think, well, obviously, the language isn't an issue because it's in Latin. Um, I think Carlier had the, this was after the council and he was, he was the most important theologian around. I think he could do whatever he wanted to. Uh, the Recollectio was introduced at Cambrai. There, there wasn't even a chapter decision. There's no evidence that anybody had to approve it. So I think he had a great deal of power. I don't, uh, Obviously, there are a lot of chapter acts. I don't remember ever coming across any people from Prague mentioned in the chapter decisions of Cambrai. But I am wondering about Aosta, and, and I still don't know if either, I think Dufay could have gone to Aosta, it's impossible to prove. I don't know if Carlier passed through Aosta during the council years. Uh, very hard to say. But evidently some Czech people did. Agnieszka has a question. Yes. Agni so Agnieszka Budzinska. I had to unmute me. Yeah. Hello, Agnieszka Budzinska. I've been at Basel. I've seen my city on many pictures. Barbara, uh, I have a question. Maybe you can get back to me. Um, Surgit Christus cum Trofeo and the Contrafact. Uh, Surgit uh, Virgo, what was the title? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, it, it is such a. Um, this piece has such a dramatic impact, and uh, I know it very well. I've recorded it. <laughs> And I was wondering how come that the theme of visitatio, which is not very dramatic per se, uh, can find a way into retexting such a piece that is, I mean, it's not only the topic, but how the piece is structured. It has this, at least the version I know, which is a Prague version, has this insisting questions uh, to Mary Magdalene, tell us what you've seen, tell us what you have seen, how did you deal with the crucifixion? Um, so I'm wondering how can um, more mild um, theme or visitatio find way into retexting this dramatic potential? This, I think, is the huge question. And mm -hmm. I don't know the literature, but it seems that there was some kind of a change of thinking about the visitation event in the 13th century. Because uh, that's even the paintings, everything seems to go back to uh, around 1300 with a few slightly earlier. And I'm wondering, maybe, I mean, this is something that's just now popping into my head. The 13th century is the century of the Crusades. There's a lot of contact between Byzantium and the West. Uh, if there, 
it, I think one would need to look closely at the way the visitation was venerated in Byzantium, perhaps. And one wonders if uh, that kind of an influence changed the way the story was told into something more dramatic. But this is just uh, an empty hypothesis. But I think this is the big question. Uh, because these paintings really are not biblical. And the Surgit Virgo is an extremely dramatic text. And I also don't know, I, I have somewhere in my house the book by Walter Lippert on Easter plays. And uh, I keep wondering if there aren't manuscripts mm -hmm. with these Easter plays that would have pieces like Surgit Virgo. And the other thing I'm interested uh, in is uh, the, whether there were more paintings of this type, whether there's probably been more research done in Prague on, on these, and maybe there are more paintings than those that I know about. But uh, it's, it's very fascinating. And also for Hannah, this is a question, because it's about the 13th century. Um, and I, again, would be interesting, interested in knowing more about contacts with specific, if there's any evidence of contacts with specific people in Paris. Because uh, Gerard of Laon had quite a broad uh, number of acquaintances. He knew people in the religious orders, Dominicans and Franciscans. He was, he I think had access to the court of Louis the Ninth. Uh, and so there, I am really wondering about uh, who was in Paris and who, which people were connected and so forth. Well, um, I will only shortly answer it as obviously people from noble families, sons from noble families, there is uh, some of them studied in Paris. Uh, but um, I'm now in recent time shifting uh, my interest from Pemostratensian to, to Cistercians, actually. We never, ne never de de um, studied much Cistercian manuscripts, Cistercian repertory. Sorry, uh, but it seems that they played um, a rather a huge role in the constitution of, of Prague liturgy around before that, and around 1300. Okay, that's interesting. Keep this in mind that Guillard of Laon is thought to have commissioned Villard de Onecourt, um, and Villard de Onecourt was, uh, was, and also uh, Guillard of Laon was a fan of the Cistercians. Mm -hmm. He had Cistercians working in his employ. He uh, used Cistercians to make the St. Elizabeth connections. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but of course the Cistercian liturgy does not come into question in the secular cathedral. But the, but the spirituality and also yeah. Political influence, which was uh, quite big in the 13th century in in uh, the in Prague, but it's a, it's another it's another huge question, and it would be another talk. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so maybe a time for the last question because um, we, I think, already almost exhausted our time. Lenka Hlavkova has a question. Lenka Hlavkova is a member of our, um, uh, of our uh, team from the Faculty of Arts of the Charles University. Lenka, you can, you can speak if you want. Yeah. Hello. Hello. I know you by name. <laughs> best, best regards from Prague. I uh, thank you very much for your, for your uh, lecture and for drawing attention to, to the uh, Central European topics let's say seen from a western point of view because i think it's important to really to have a look at sources and to look not only for distribution of uh, let's say most uh, recent music and let's say the 
uh, uh, complicated music like polyphony, which is mostly studied, uh, so, so let's say, a distribution from West to, to Central Europe. But uh, I think it's important to see that there were also other ways of, uh, of uh, transmission of music and uh, that there were also other motivations why to, why to uh, let's, um, uh, adopt uh, different repertories and different uh, uh, liturgies. And uh, I would like just to add that we, uh, we start a little project with the David Byrne, uh, which, should, which should focus on uh, exchange between low countries and Central Europe. And we hope that we contribute also to this topic with some, some new findings. Marvelous, that's great. And I hope, um, I'm very eager to get my book out there because I think then there will give people ideas of further work. And I'm stopping because otherwise I'll never finish it. So I'm very eager to have other people take up what I've done and if it's useful to them, go for it. <laughs> go further with it. Okay. Time for a last question. Let here. me just say it's wonderful to see all of you. <laughs> and thank you for your patience and attention. I think there are no questions coming. So Barbara, thank you very, very much once again to come with us into this virtual room. I hope that we will make it a tradition to uh, meet regular on regular basis. <laughs> we announced we have very soon a conference on Cantus Fractus coming, which will come uh, back to Council of Basel and Council of, uh, of uh, Constance. And we, uh, there, I thought that somebody is uh, raised a hand. So thank you. Thank you everybody to attending this lecture. Uh, stay safe and healthy, which is very important and of good mind, very important yeah. today. And we are very much looking forward to see you next year, latest at our next lecture. And if somebody wants to hang around and uh, just to say hello, I am staying on this, um, in this Zoom for a while because I saw many familiar faces. So mm -hmm. I'm saying goodbye to everybody who is who has to go but staying for those who would like to have a small chat still. So thank you very much again. Bye. <laughs>